Hello, my name is Dr. Jacob Graham, and this is the first video in a series of seven that will teach the basic ideas of Schenkerian analysis. In order to understand the topics covered in this series, you will need to make sure that you have a good grip on species counterpoint. My channel also has a playlist that teaches an introduction to Fuchs style species counterpoint, and there are other good counterpoint resources on YouTube. So look to those if you want a refresher before continuing. Right off the bat, I should mention that a lot of good musicians don't like Schenkerian analysis. And the brunt of their criticism is aimed at the Ursatz, or the fundamental structure, which is often held up to be Schenker's main idea. There's a running joke that, for Schenker, every piece of music can be reduced to a variation on three blind mice. And I agree that if all Schenker had tried to do was reduce pieces to his fundamental structure, then his theory wouldn't have very much explanatory power to it. It would be a lot like Anne Elk's theory of the Brontosaurus from a well-known Monty Python sketch. My theory is along the following lines. Oh, God. All Brontosauruses are thin at one end, much, much thicker in the middle, and then thin again at the far end. That is the theory that I have and which is mine and what it is too. That's it, is it? Right, Chris. Obviously, the thin, thick, thin model of the Brontosaurus is true of all Brontosauruses, but it's also obviously a trivial description, because the same thing could be said about the shape of a calzone. All Schenker's ersatz is really saying is that a piece of tonal music will begin in the tonic, have a dominant chord somewhere in the middle, and end in the tonic again. I think a lot of teachers overemphasize the importance of the ersatz for students new to Schenkerian analysis. And I won't return to this idea until the final video in the series, when, hopefully, we will be better prepared to understand why it isn't quite as trivial as Anne Elk's theory. A decent metaphor for Schenkerian analysis is prime factorization. You can take any positive integer and express it as a product of prime numbers. This example from Wikipedia shows how 864 can be expressed as 2 to the 5th times 3 to the 3rd. Schenker wanted to show something similar with tonal music. You can take a complicated piece of music and by using a few basic analytical tools, show how it is composed of simpler structures, of which the ersatz is only the most famous. The explanatory power of Schenker's theory doesn't come from the fact that he arrives at the same basic structures no matter what piece of music you select for analysis. It instead comes from the intermediate structures that are halfway between the concrete notes written by the composer and the abstract prototypes of Schenker's theory. Some people think of Schenker's theory exclusively as a theory of reduction, and it certainly is that at one level. But Schenker himself preferred to describe his theory as retracing the act of composition from simple conventional structures to the more complex and specific ones. He called this process composing out of a basic structure. By the way, I'm going to avoid talking about Schenker too much as a person, since nowadays he is well known as a Germanocentric chauvinist and racist, and his biography isn't particularly relevant to understanding his ideas. When we want to give a new theory a fair shake, it is usually a good idea, first, to try to understand the problem the theory is intended to solve. The three big composers of the classical period, Haydn, Mozart, and Beethoven, all learned counterpoint at one time or another from Fuchs's Gratus ad Parnassum. All three of them swore by it and even used it when teaching their own students. But there is a clear discrepancy between the exercises produced in studying counterpoint and these composers' actual music. Fuchs, for instance, doesn't allow leaps by a dissonant interval, and Haydn, Mozart, and Beethoven clearly break this rule in their own music. Schenker had a word for these compositional regimes. He called the academic exercises of species counterpoint strenger Satz, or strict composition and the actual music composed in this time period, Freiesatz, or free composition. His theory was aimed at explaining the discrepancy 
and bridging the gap between strict and free composition. In truth, very little of Schenker's theory was actually all that original. He drew heavily on 18th century theories of melody, especially theories of counterpoint and theories of ornamentation. His main predecessors in this regard were Johann Josef Fuchs's Gratis ad Parnassum, mentioned earlier, and the essay on the true art of playing keyboard instruments by C.P.E. Bach. He also thoroughly studied the major ornamentation treatises of Quantz and Leopold Mozart. At first glance, counterpoint and ornamentation seem to deal with completely different subjects. Ornamentation has something to do with performance, and counterpoint has to do with the coordination of voices in a polyphonic texture. However, counterpoint and ornamentation are both theories of melodic organization, and Schenker chose to put these two subjects into dialogue with one another, and to build his own theory of melodic organization in the common ground between them. There are a whole host of different technical terms and jargon associated with Schenkerian analysis that can be pretty intimidating for those interested in starting to learn it. But there are really only four basic categories of tools in Schenker's analytical toolbox, and we will give individualized attention to each one in subsequent videos. The first kind of tool is called horizontalization which means, in a nutshell, to take something vertical, or in other words, harmonic, and to make it horizontal or melodic. The most common kind of horizontalization is in arpeggiation, but there are also other types. Another tool is diminution, which means to take a melodic span that would otherwise be a leap and to fill it in stepwise. You can imagine, as an example, the spans opened up by an arpeggiation, then being filled in by stepwise diminutions. A third category of tools is the harmonic transformation. Schenker conceives of chromaticism as alterations of seven basically diatonic scale degrees. And of course, scale degrees are going to be important for a theory that is premised on melodic motion through a scale. The last tool is displacement, which has to do with shifting the metrical placement of contrapuntal lines relative to one another. The obvious example is the suspension from Fuchs's fourth species of counterpoint. But displacement was also theorized extensively by theorists after Schenker, notably Arthur Komar and William Rothstein. As I mentioned earlier, most of Schenker's theory has firm precedence in earlier melodic theories. But Schenker's one big original idea is what makes the entire theory fit together and how he solves the discrepancy between strict and free composition mentioned earlier. This is his theory of levels. Here we see one of Schenker's famous analytical graphs where he has taken Chopin's revolutionary etude and has stratified its voice leading into various levels. All you need to explain each of the levels individually are the four analytical tools mentioned above and the rules of strict counterpoint. The aspects that are unique to free composition emerge out of interactions between the various levels. The deepest level, with the least amount of detail, is called the background and this is where the ersatz resides. There are then sometimes several levels of middle ground. It really depends on how much detail the analyst wants to show. And finally, the foreground typically has lots of detail and it begins to resemble something like the actual composition. The real punch to Schenker's theory comes from how you can use middle ground goals to explain sometimes very curious details in the foreground. This first video was intended to frame the main ideas in Schenkerian analysis and to preview some of the topics that we will cover in the rest of the video course. 
The other six videos will in a way replicate the organization of this video, but in much greater detail. In video two, we will look at some of the preliminaries for understanding Schenker's methods, including figured base and an introduction to his use of analytic notation. The next four videos will go into greater depth with the four categories of analytical tools and introduce further vocabulary and notational conventions. The final video will revisit the theory of levels, the ersatz, and the complete graphic analysis.